Hello. The topic of school bullying has been very much in the news lately, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. But I'm going to focus on two specific aspects. One, I'm going to focus on the gender stereotypes that underlies a lot of bullying. And second, I'm going to talk about the similarities this bullying has to the race-based lynching that took place in the American South during the Civil Rights era. This is Emmett Till, and in 1955, at the age of 14, Emmett Till was dragged from his home by a lynch mob, beaten and killed and dumped in the Tallahatchie River. Why would the lynch mob do this? Well, he had allegedly whistled at a white woman. In other words, he had violated the social code at the time of white supremacy. And this is how lynch mobs operate. We all have legal codes that govern our behavior, but there's also social codes that we're expected to adhere to. Lynch mobs in the American South were very effective because they policed the social code of white supremacy. And what made them so effective was the fear they generated and the degree to which they involved the greater community. Now this fear, when a lynch mob would lynch someone, we might have a dead body, but the more profound effect was the general community would be fearful that the same could happen to them. Any step out of line could cause the same problems to happen. So it was a great deterrent, and this fear permeated these people's entire lives. The second aspect, and what made the fear more pronouncing, was the community involvement. There wasn't one or two people who would come harm you. The entire community would get behind it. You see many pictures of lynchings like the one here, and you'll see the whole town out there. You even see children. They would even give the children sticks and have them poke the dead body. So it wasn't just one or two. It was the community. Anyone could harm you. As we progressed, we learned that death was not required. Someone could be lynched in a spiritual or physical sense. The best example would be the children of segregation. The Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education noted the psychological harms that befell these children. They were lynched in, in, in emotionally, spiritually, other senses of the word. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about how I think lynching on the basis of gender stereotypes, bullying on the basis of gender stereotypes approximates a form of lynching. You're going to see a lot of photos like this. And these are photos of parents and children who have lost their lives to bullying, either in their own hands or the hand of another. To start with, though, I need to make the point that there's a difference between bullying and teasing. We're all teased. That happens all the time. Bullying is something more. Bullying is a systematic treatment over a long time that produces a number of harms, often at the hands of several different people. And as I'm going to discuss today, it is that level of bullying that causes the harms we're talking to tonight. The social code at issue here that I want to talk about instead of white supremacy is that of gender conformity. As soon as we're born and wrapped in either that pink or blue blanket, there's certain expectations that we, should, that we are expected to adhere to. Step outside the bounds and people will police our gender behavior. You're not being male enough. For men, it is, specific, it is, is particularly pronounced. We have in this country what we call hegemonic mas masculinity. There is one form of masculinity, sort of the gold standard we expect men to adhere to, and that is something marked by competitiveness, aggression, stoicism, essentially anything not feminine. Those children who are most bullied, these become victims of chronic bullying, are those children who don't fit in their gender stereotypes. Boys who do things boys aren't supposed to do. Girls who things, do things girls aren't supposed to do. <clears throat> A child does not have to be someone who's going to grow up to be gay to be in this group. Any child who does anything perceived as outside the norm is subject to this treatment. What makes it particularly harmful is it's not just a bully who is hurting the child, but the community in general gets behind it because of these stereotypes. There are many cases where school administrators condone the bullying or either joined into it. And the cumulative effect of all this is it sends the message to the child, you deserve the treatment that you're getting. Is there harm? Often people say to me, hey, you're talking about bumps and bruises and hurt feelings. No, when we're talking about chronic bullying, the harm goes far beyond that. We're talking about death, either at the person's hands or the hands of someone else. And we're also talking about psychological harm. A growing body count. I cannot in 20 seconds do justice to the number of children who have lost their lives to bullying. Instead, I'll just give you this one story. In 2009, in a span of two weeks, two 11-year-old boys in two different states hung themselves because they had been subjected to homophobic bullying for a long period of time. 11 years old, that's fifth grade. 
The psychological effects are something we're also starting to learn about. Children who are bullied exhibit greater signs of depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, poor performance in school, and longitudinal studies show that these effects last beyond the bullying, beyond the school years. Even the success later in life is very much determined by what happened to them as a bullied child. So is this lynching? <clears throat> I argue that it is, because we have a social code of gender norms. Step outside the social code, the community at large will police it in a way that's quite brutal, that will send a message of centralized fear to the overall community, and will cause grave harm to those who are subjected to this process. So what, what can we do about it? And by the way, this is a picture of a lynch mob that has just been found not guilty, and they're celebrating. Is litigation the answer? I argue that it's not, because for litigation, we need a child to tell his parents what's happened, and we need the parents to sue. Children who are bullied are too ashamed to tell their parents, and often the parents are too ashamed that their child is being bullied to draw greater attention to it. How about legislation? Some states have passed laws requiring schools to report bullying. Here's the problem. By the time the bullying has happened, the harm's already done. The other thing is the school has been given the discretion to determine when it's bullying versus teasing. And often schools will side with the bully, as I discussed earlier. What about education? I think that's probably going to be the answer, but education as to what? Certainly bullying, the harm to bullying, but the other thing we need to talk about is these gender stereotypes that underlie chronic bullying, the way to which they're driving this, and how we as a community can help combat it. We certainly want to combat sexism in other areas. This is another one where we need to look at that. I close with the, <clears throat> some lines from the song Baby Mine. I love this song. We tell the child, pay no heed what they say. Guess what, that's just not a realistic solution. Instead, the community, just as they've caused this problem, is gonna to have to be involved in the cure of it. Only then can we make sure that all our children have the chance to have eyes that sparkle and shine. Thank you. <laughs>